You don't know their names. You've never seen their faces. Garbo, Tricycle, Treasure, Brutus, and Bronx. British spies during the Second World War. Their mission, deceive Adolf Hitler to ensure the success of the D-Day landings in Normandy. The double agents, the wireless deception, the false information fed to foreign diplomats. This was brilliantly handled. A life in the shadows that transformed these five agents into masters of deception. His case officer thought he was the best actor in the world. I never like to give my opinion unless I have strong reasons to justify my assurances. This is the classified story of three men and two women you've never heard of who changed the course of history. the Second World War, Hitler's Germany continued to extend its influence. Prague, Paris, Copenhagen. Europe's big cities fall one by one under the yoke of the Nazi army. By November 1943, the Third Reich and its Führer reigned supreme over 15 countries. Britain, United States and Canada join forces to liberate occupied Europe. They launch the operation Overlord. Its goal, to land thousands of soldiers on the beaches of Normandy in June 1944 and push the Nazi army to the borders of Germany. It's risky. The enemy has been expecting a major attack somewhere along the Atlantic coast and victory isn't assured against the powerful Reich Army. The SS Panzer Divisions, I would say, were among the greatest fighting formations that the world has ever seen. And they had these brilliant tanks. Of course, the Allies had many more tanks, but the German Tigers and Panther tanks were superb. The German Army, as an institution, I would say, was much better than the British and the Americans. So how does one deal with the powerful army of the Third Reich? How do the Allies ensure a successful landing in Normandy? In wartime, truth is so precious that it should be attended by a bodyguard of lies. A bodyguard of lies. When he pronounces these words on December 1st, 1943, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill has a very specific plan. Hitler must be tricked. Winston Churchill especially, but also many of the Allied commanders knew that if the Germans in the West were able to deploy their full strength in the first 24 or 48 hours after the invasion, they could well have thrown the Allies back into the sea. But if they could distract, divert, slow the Germans, then the operation could succeed. Churchill wanted surprise. That was the only way in which the invasion was going to be a success. The HM Treasury is one of many official buildings in London. In its basement, a bunker built discreetly in 1938, the War Cabinet. Here, in 1943, the biggest deception campaign in military history is conceived. Operation Bodyguard. At the head of the mission, the London Controlling Section, an ultra-secret organization of high-ranking Army and Secret Service personnel. 
They craft a crazy plan. To make Hitler believe that several landings will take place at the end of the summer of 44. In Calais, in Norway, in the southwest of France, and in the Mediterranean. Everywhere except the actual place of the landing, Normandy. To give substance to the plan, the Allies create a phantom army, the first US Army Group, or FUSAG, stationed in the southeast of England. At its head, a true general, George S. Patton, well known by the Germans for his campaigns in North Africa and Sicily. Germans expected him to play a major role in the landings, so publicly it was announced that he was going to command the first United States Army Group. And the components of the first United States Army Group were deployed in exactly where the Germans expected to see them, in the southeast of England, in anticipation of embarking for the Patekele. The English film studios perfect the illusion of Fuzag. They create dozens of inflatable tanks and wooden boats, truer than life decoys deployed to the southeast of England. The deception plan was based on what the Germans were predisposed to believe. So in anticipation of an invasion of the Pas de Calais, you would expect a concentration of troops in the southeast of England. How do you accomplish that? There were reports in the newspapers of fights amongst American troops arguing over women in pubs and hotels in the southeast of England. It actually never happened, but these were reports that were put into the newspapers. With the first part of the lie in place, the misinformation campaign expands. That duty falls to another ultra-secretive organization, the 20 Committee, or Double Cross. Led by Sir John Cecil Masterman, it brings together representatives of the London Controlling Section, British Secret Services, and Allied Armies. Its mission, using a network of double agents to mislead intelligence services of the Reich. These spies, who gained the confidence of the Germans, actually worked for the Allies. Among them, three men and two women play a crucial role in Operation Bodyguard. Their code names, Tricycle, Bronx, Brutus, Garbo, and Treasure. Double Cross was by far the most important deception operation of the war, and the agents involved in it were absolutely critical. Everybody knew that if D-Day failed, then all sorts of things were possible. Whereas if D-Day succeeded and the Allies got ashore, then the war in the West was sooner or later decided. The National Archives of Kew and the suburbs of London preserve all the details of this vast sham. Some top secret documents now declassified reveal the crucial role these spies played in pulling off the largest military operation of the 20th century. Jorge, you are very right to think that I am an awful person to correspond with, but believe it or not, I could not find half an hour to write to you. I'm dropping you these few lines only to tell you that you should not worry so much about your sister. She regained her health completely and nobody would believe that she was a very ill girl a few months ago.
In this seemingly harmless letter, a double agent discreetly sends a message to his German spy master. Between the lines, he writes another text in invisible ink made of diluted aspirin. Good spies, spies that want to live a long time, don't want to have any proprietary spycraft equipment with them. Their safety is that they simply look like a normal citizen. So if they could access common household chemicals, something they could buy from a pharmacy, then they could create an ink to use to communicate to their headquarters. Invisible ink is simple to make. Revealing it takes more effort. The German intelligence services developed a complex two-step method. First, they coated the letter with a chemical solution and let it dry for at least an hour. Then, they coated the letter with another secret mix of chemicals. After the second solution dried, the message would slowly reveal itself. The German loved this two-step formula. And the reason for this was that counterintelligence services, often in the postal system, developed broad techniques that they would use to test multiple letters. They would make a cocktail of various reagents, take a small brush, paint it across the face of the envelope to see if any hidden writing developed. But with a two-part system, it would never ever expose the writing underneath. This seemingly bland letter, written eight months before D-Day, hides an invisible message revealed in the transcripts. It is one of thousands kept in the National Archives pertaining to Operation Bodyguard. On the left, the cover letter. To the right, the secret writing. I have too much material to send you by letter, and as nothing is extremely urgent, I will bring it with me in about three weeks. The secret text is signed with the code name, Evan. For the British Secret Service, this is the double agent Tricycle. His real name, Dushko Popov, a 30-year-old Serbian who studied law in Germany. Dushko Popov, I thought before the invention of James Bond that he was James Bond. He was suave, good-looking, he had this ability to seduce women, he was a great womanizer. He was a very amusing raconteur. He had a funny story for every occasion. He was a gambler and he was a party goer and a wonderful playboy, but really very good company and very entertaining. And you couldn't fail but adore Dushko. One would think that uh, having high profile activities, running around with women, partying, all of those things would increase the risk to an agent. If you're looking for an agent, you're looking generally for the little gray man or woman, somebody who floats below the surface, doesn't draw attention to themselves, and does the job. In Popoff's case, of course, he wasn't that person. But interestingly, that sort of served him well, because I think the Germans, number one, they weren't very curious about it, but number two, had they been curious, they would have, uh, they would have thought, okay, no, no reasonable intelligence service would ever accept a man like this as an agent. Marko Popov is the son of the agent Tricycle. Today, he is the custodian of his father's archives and personal history. Dushko, after his studies in Belgrade, went to take his doctorate in Freiburg in Germany. And there he met a German of Danish origins called uh, Johnny Jepsen. 
They both shared a nonchalant uh, playboy style of life. Both had uh, rich uh, parents, uh, enjoyed life, uh, enjoyed whatever they could in those days. And both were so pro-freedom that they ostensibly showed their despise for the Hitlerian regime. A few years later, Dushko Popov learns that his friend Johnny is enlisted in the Abwehr, the German secret service, and wants to recruit him. Dushko and Johnny were a good tandem, and they already, without words, knew what they could expect of each other. So without saying it openly, it was clear from the start to Dushko that Johnny could not have been working with the Abwehr intentionally without some subterfuge. Dushko Popov is convinced that Johnny secretly intends to become a double agent and share German intelligence with the Allies. In following his friend's idea, Dushko agrees to join the Abwehr. And in 1940, Popov starts working for MI5 and moves to London. The Germans suspect nothing. They have full confidence in the information he sends them. Undercover as a ministerial attaché for the Yugoslav government, Popov travels regularly to Portugal, where he meets Major Ludovico von Karstoff, his German case master. He usually set up his meetings at the Baccarat roulette table in the casino in Estoril, and they would point by putting the dices on the numbers, the day, the time, of the place of the appointment where an Abwehr car would pick him up. He'd uh, jump in the back seat and would then hide low in the car as they would come into uh, von Karstoff's villa. At each meeting, von Karstoff gives several questionnaires to Dushko Popov, documents that the spy can carry discreetly, thanks to a surprising technology, the microdot. A micropunct or a micro dot is a photographic reduction, typically of a page of text, to a size that it is so small that it is unreadable without some additional form of optical magnification. You can see that there's a dot there, but you can't see what's on it. This was one of the great developments during World War II. because it was so small, he could get, keep it hidden, and that way it wouldn't be detected when he crossed a border. The only way he could read it would be simply using a small microscope. Once back in London, the spy reads the questions asked by the ad there. Of course, he transmits these documents to the Double Cross Committee, which provides the answers. Tricycle's Playboy Socialite Lifestyle provides the committee with the perfect cover to justify the origin of its information. For months, the double agent performs a real balancing act between London and Portugal. The slightest misstep could expose him to the German secret services. The double agent in dealing with two handlers is dealing with two professionals. Both professionals are always looking for indications of whether or not that double agent is, quote, loyal to them, unquote, or not. And uh, so there will be, during the course of any double agent operation, the double agent will have to face situations where the other side is testing him. The agent must be vigilant in all circumstances. And he frankly must develop stories to fit whatever he's doing. So if he goes to meet the service that's actually controlling him, he has to have a story to tell the other service, right? So I go to Portugal, I go to Lisbon, 
why am I in Lisbon? I'm in Lisbon for a business reason or some other reason, but he has to have a story to tell the other service. Any mistake he makes can have drastic consequences for him. Very quickly, Popov becomes one of Abwehr's favorite spies. But the double agent has no idea of the extent of the deception. None of the agents knew that they were part of a major deception campaign. Each believed that they were operating individually and independently. They didn't even know the real names of their own case officers who were supposedly, frankly, their best friends. The Double Cross Committee keeps every agent somewhat in the dark. After devising the misinformation they want to feed to the Germans, the committee fragments it and distributes the seemingly unrelated pieces to the spy masters of the double agents. At the end of the chain, the spies have no sense of the big picture. The D-Day landings from an intelligence perspective is a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You're not showing the picture on the lid of the jigsaw puzzle to your enemy. What you're giving him are the pieces of the puzzle. And these pieces don't just fit together, they overlap. And that overlapping is called source verification. And it means that one piece of information authenticates the second piece of information. And you leave it to the enemy who reach the conclusion that they're already predisposed to believe. Little by little, a false history is written in parallel to the real one, in which the Allied armies are more numerous, better equipped, and ready to attack the Third Reich in different places. Spreading the deception requires double agents on the front line. One of them will push his commitment to the Allied cause to the extreme. Code names, Garbo on the British side, Alaric on the German side. Juan Pujol Garcia, a Spaniard, is one of the British Crown's best and most imaginative spies. His career begins in 1939 at the end of the Spanish Civil War. Revolted by totalitarianism, he decides to take action against the Nazi ideology as he relates in his memoirs published in 1986. I yearned for justice from the melody of tangled ideas and fantasies going around and around in my head. A plan slowly began to take shape. I must do something, something practical. I must make my contribution to the good of humanity. Tamara Chrysler is Agent Garbo's granddaughter and one of the heirs of her grandparents' incredible story. I don't think that my grandfather and my grandmother decided to become spies. I think it was more the circumstances that took them to, to this situation. They were very young, they were very enthusiastic, they were dreamers. They had suffered a lot because of the Spanish Civil War. So for them, it was, uh, I don't think it was just, let's become spies, but it was like, we have to do something, whatever, but something. This is, we cannot let's, let the world go this, this crazy way. Juan Pujol Garcia and his wife, Araceli, try to contact the Allied Secret Services. But the Allies send the inexperienced young couple home. They then approach the German secret services with the aim of feeding them false information. The Germans recruit them as early as 1941. Under the code name Alaric, Garcia begins to provide information live from London, except that he has never set foot in the British capital. He had managed to get as far as a village just outside Lisbon called Cascais. From there, he pretended that he was already in England and that he had recruited a KLM civilian air crew who was traveling on a regular basis, flying between England and Portugal. And this was the explanation 
for why Alaric's letters were postmarked in Lisbon, because he said his courier would deliver them uh, to the mailbox in Lisbon. With the aid of tour guides, maps, train schedules and some British newspapers, Alaric invents himself a whole life in England and sends dozens of letters to his German contact. He and his wife push the trick even further. They pretend that Alaric has recruited other agents, making him the head of a network of spies that exists only in their imagination. They actually created their own misinformation operation without ever hearing about the Double Cross Committee. They were freelancers, spies. That I mean, if you think about it, it's like, who is a freelance spy <laughs> any moment of... It's, it's a pretty peculiar concept of being a freelancer spy. In April 1942, more than two years before D-Day, the English finally noticed this prolific informant who earned the trust of the Germans. Juan Pujol Garcia moves to London with his wife, and he joins the Double Cross Network under the codename Garbo. The reason why he was codenamed Garbo by the British Security Service was that his case officer thought he was the best actor in the world. He would, as we say, be able to sell snow to the Eskimos. He was a brilliant actor, and he had a unique style he would take three pages to say something that you and I could say in two paragraphs. Under the direction of his spy master, Thomas Harris, Garbo quickly expands his network of fictional informants, creating 27 imaginary agents. If I were interviewing Garbo, one of the questions I would say is, how'd you keep all these things straight? I mean, keeping 27 agents in balance and so they don't look suspicious to the Germans, that's a very disciplined element to have to deal with day in and, and day out. A small mistake with one of his sub-agents could really destroy the whole operation. Thanks to constant vigilance, Garbo and Harris managed to maintain the ruse of all these imaginary informants. Day after day, they perpetuate the disinformation business of Operation Bodyguard, alongside other double agents, real this time. visit to Bristol, I noticed a considerable number of American soldiers and officers wearing a big black A. These are the words of Natalie Sergeyev, a.k.a. Lily, born in Russia, raised in Paris. She offers her services to the Abwehr at the beginning of the war. Like Tricycle and Garbo, She's not a Nazi sympathizer and intends to portray the Germans from the very beginning. As soon as the German secret services send her to London, she applies to MI5 to become a double agent. From now on, her name is Solange for the Abwehr and Treasure for the Allies. But when she settles in England, Treasure makes an unusual demand. She wants her dog, Babs, to travel with her. Lily Sergeyev was a, a very difficult woman, a very unusual woman. And the one individual that she had a long-term relationship was her dog, Babs. And she had no understanding, even in the middle of the war, that there were very strict quarantine controls in the United Kingdom because the UK, unlike the rest of Europe, had never had rabies. So absolutely under no circumstances could Babs travel with her until Babs had completed the six-month quarantine. So a big problem. But it was agreed that she would travel on her own and that Babs would go into quarantine in Gibraltar before following her. 
treasurer works hard for the Double Cross Committee. When the Germans send her to describe the insignia of the soldiers she sees during her travels, the committee tells her what to report. The German intelligence service collected their information from a very limited number of sources. But what they really needed was the Mark I eyeball for somebody to go into the local village and to see the shoulder flashes the, or the insignia on the troops or the insignia on the tanks or on the vehicles. The mere observation of a single soldier with insignia in a particular place on a particular date has the effect of authenticating a great deal of other information. For months, Treasure and others pass thousands of small pieces of information to the Reich. And to make sure these lies are effective, the British Secret Service employs a brilliant tool, the Bletchley Park Decryption Center. Here, more than 8,000 people try to decrypt German messages. The men of the Reich can keep no secrets from the agents of the British Crown. You can watch a message delivered by Garbo to Madrid, and you can follow the same message being delivered to Berlin, and then you can see the reaction in Berlin sending a message, perhaps a questionnaire, seeking more information on particular subjects to Madrid, which is then transmitted to Garbo in another hand cipher. The huge advantage of being able to monitor the enemy traffic is that it was a guarantee that the enemy had been hooked completely and believed the information that they were receiving was authentic. The intercepted messages leave no room for doubt. The double agents have won the confidence of the Germans. In May 1944, a month before the landing, the Reich's secret services are convinced that the Allied troops are concentrated mainly in the Dover region and on the East Coast. The Germans position their armies according to what they think they know, putting their three key divisions in the Calais area. But here is the real position of the Allied troops, massively gathered a little further west, ready to attack the beaches of Normandy. Now to maintain the deception until the landing, the double agents intensify the urgency of their messages. Send 50 pounds fast. I need it for my dentist. This telegram is sent on May 15, 1944 at sender Elvira Josefina Concepcion de la Fuente Chaudois, alias Agent Bronx. daughter of a rich Peruvian diplomat. She is known for her partying, seduction, and her love of playing bridge. An excellent cover for transmitting high society gossip. This mundane telegraph hides a coded message for her case officer. The sum of money actually denotes a specific geographical area, the target of an upcoming allied attack the Bay of Biscay, north of Spain. The reference to her dentist denotes her level of certainty about the information. Finally, the urgency of her request indicates when this attack will take place. On May 15, 1944, the Abwehr's decoded telegram reads, in a month, around June 15, an attack will definitely take place in the Bay of Biscay. What you have in the Bay of Biscay, you have this SS Panzer Division Das Reich, a very consequential unit. And when this message comes through, the military keeps it there. So basically you have this telegram coming through that paralyzes a very consequential unit of the German military. 
a full SS Panzer Division is, sits in place waiting for an invasion that never comes. Operation Bodyguard continues to pay off. The landing is imminent and the Allies are confident. But suddenly, the unexpected happens. Johnny Jepson, Agent Tricycle's best friend and member of the Misinformation Network, is arrested by the Gestapo. He was suspected, rightly, of having embezzled a large amount of money out of the Abwehr. The problem was, would he try and make a deal with the Gestapo? Would he disclose the information that he knew? Would he compromise Dushko Popov? Juan Pujol, codenamed Garbo, was himself under threat because it became clear that information about him had reached Yebsen. So all of this was in the balance when Yebsen was arrested, and that created a major crisis for the Double Cross Committee. The British Security Service holds its breath. Then, almost at the same time, another threat arises. When she visited Lisbon, she had fixed up a control sign with Kleeman, which she had not told us about on her return. She refused to divulge what the signal was. This report is written by Agent Mary Scherer, Treasure's case officer. She reveals that Treasure is threatening to tell her German contact everything. Why? The death of her dog Babs crushed by a truck while in quarantine abroad. Lily Sergeyev was interested in, in only two things, herself and her dog. And in terms of motivation, she was extremely angry about the loss of her dog, to the extent that it jeopardized her mission. There was a danger perceived by MI5 that she might tell the Germans that actually she was operating a double game. At the end of May 1944, Jepson's arrest and Treasure's threats plunge the Double Cross Committee into crisis. Operation Bodyguard teeters on failure. But too late to call it off. The committee stops Tricycle's activities and prevents Treasure from writing her own reports. They decide Garbo is too valuable to take out of service. On the night of June 5th to June 6th, 1944, just a few hours before the landing, he transmits a message of paramount importance to the Germans. He wrote to me three days ago announcing the distribution of cold rations and vomit bags to the 3rd Canadian Division. After the 3rd Canadian Division had left, Americans came in, rumors having reached him that the 3rd Canadian Division had embarked. In this letter, Garbo announces the imminent landing in Normandy. It's the truth, the ultimate poker hand for Operation Bodyguard before D-Day. It was a brilliant stroke of MI5 to get Garbo to send a message on the night of D-Day saying the Allies are coming to increase Garbo's credibility. Thanks to this message, Garbo keeps the German Secret Service's confidence. An indispensable ruse to maintain the deception as the Allied ships leave the English coast for Normandy. The Nazi general staff still believes it is just a diversion. The morning of June 6th, 1944, the big day. Eight thousand warships moor off Normandy, and 175,000 men storm the beaches. Meanwhile, in Germany, nobody seems alarmed, not even Hitler. 
Hitler was at the Berghof, which was his mountain retreat in the German Alps. On the night of June 5th, he was actually watching movies with Ava Brown and Joseph Goebbels. Goebbels left around two o'clock in the morning, and then Hitler went to bed around three o'clock. And no one was to disturb him. Hitler himself had anticipated that there would be an attack, but that it would be a diversion in anticipation of a much larger attack. So when news of Normandy came, you didn't want to wake him up for an attack that would prove to be a diversion. Then you realize that in one of the most consequential moments, you know, Hitler slept. On the beaches of Normandy, the fight rages. In the first 24 hours, more than 10,000 Allied soldiers are killed, wounded, or missing. But the German defenses gradually fall. No reinforcements come to repel the Allies. Jepsen and Treasure did not compromise the operation after all. On the evening of June 6th, the war is far from over. Allied armies must now advance into enemy territory. What we have to remember is although in the eyes of the world, the fact the Allies got ashore on D-Day, June the 6th, this is the big day, success, triumph, victory, it was not that simple. The planners had always expected that the key battle would be in the days and weeks that followed, and that if the Germans after D-Day were able to reinforce more quickly by land, than the Allies by sea, the Germans could still win the battle. And so a huge amount hinged on how quickly the Germans moved their armored divisions from the Pas de Calais. For now, the Germans believe Normandy is a diversionary ploy. They still expect a major attack in the Pas de Calais. But how long will they believe it? After the 6th of June 1944, you might think that the deception campaign would be over, but that was just the first half. The second half was equally as important, and it was to maintain the fiction of the main invasion was due to take place at any moment in the Pas de Calais. As early as June 7th, all the agents still in the race send new reports to their German handlers. They cannot be more explicit. An attack in Calais is imminent. From the report mentioned, it is perfectly clear that the present attack is a large-scale operation, but diversionary. I never like to give my opinion unless I have strong reasons to justify my assurances. Only part of Allied force in Normandy operation. Bulk remains here at present. USAC was, as I reported, ready to attack at any moment. But it is obvious now that it will be a separate action, hub. This last message is sent by agent hub for Uber. British code name, Brutus. As a former officer of the Polish Air Force, whose real name was Roman Darby Cianowski, he was recruited as a double agent two years earlier. As D-Day approaches, he becomes an essential player in the deception campaign. In 1944, he was attached as a liaison officer to Wentworth, which was the supposed headquarters of the 1st United States Army Group, which first of all confirmed the existence of FUSAG, and secondly gave an opportunity for direct information to be passed to the Germans about the 1st United States Army Group. The day after June 6th, Agent Brutus sends a barrage of messages to the Abwehr. His mission, make them believe that Fusag, the fictional army he is a part of, is ready to land in Calais. Still saw in Brentwood some soldiers of the 351st U.S. Infantry Division. They were currently attached to the 121st U.S. Corps and sent to Kent. Northern regions of Harwich and around Ipswich seem to be prepared as staging areas for boarding. 
Given the deluge of supporting information, the Germans feel confident. The lie endures for days and even weeks. It took seven weeks for the Germans to finally tumble to the fact that there was not going to be a second invasion. I mean, even in July, there were twice as many troops at the Pas de Calais than at Normandy. Finally, on the 27th of July, four panzer divisions are sent from the Pas de Calais down to Normandy. Here we are, you know, a month and a half after the initial invasion. One among many things that's extraordinary about fortitude is the Allies' biggest hope was they could just maintain uncertainty through D-Day, and then they thought, if they were very lucky, they might maintain German uncertainty for a few days. And what was incredible is that it persisted for weeks that the Germans went on and on, leaving these forces here in the Pas de Calais. So fortitude was as successful as the Allied hoped at the beginning, but far more successful than they'd ever dared to hope in the days and weeks that followed. At the end of July 1944, when Hitler finally gives the order to send reinforcements to Normandy, he's too late. The Allies are already progressing through French territory. And on August the 25th, they liberate Paris. The fighting continues for many months, but the die is cast. Reich armies are sandwiched between Allied forces in the West and Russian forces in the East. On April 30th, 1945, Soviet troops invade Berlin and Hitler commits suicide in his bunker. A week later, on May 8th, Germany surrenders. The Second World War is finally over in Europe. Still today, the landing of June 6, 1944 ranks as one of the most remarkable military events of the 20th century. But history has almost forgotten the extraordinary misinformation campaign that made it happen. If the deception campaign had failed or been disbelieved or even worse, had been compromised, the consequences would have been absolutely enormous and failure might have meant that we'd be conducting this interview in German. The double agents sustained brilliantly confusion in German minds and the coordination, it was undoubtedly one of the great British success stories of the war. The double agents, the wireless deception, um, the um, false information fed to foreign diplomats, all the rest of it, this was brilliantly handled. At the end of the war, the double agents aren't even aware of the central role they played. Most leave England and resume their normal lives. After the war, these agents went back to a life of obscurity. Garbo ultimately went to live in Venezuela and was employed by Shell Oil as an interpreter and an English teacher ended up running a small bed and breakfast in Maracaibo. Tricycle Dushko Popov became a CIA agent, operated in the European community as the director of the iron and steel and coal agreements. Brutus became a printer and operated a small print shop in the Fulham Road in London. Lily Segev married an American army officer she met in Paris and went to live with him in the United States. Bronx, Elvira de la Fuente, opened a couturier shop just opposite one of the best hotels in the Riviera in beaulieu sur mer For years, the story of these men and women in the shadows has remained highly classified. But little by little, the veil of secrecy has lifted to reveal these spies who contributed so much to the success of this truly game-changing military operation.